Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio, Mystery, Suspense, Dramas, and Horrors, where we bring to you the most mysterious tales that the golden age of radio had to offer. And now, with over 167 episodes broadcast on NBC Radio from 1949 to 1953, we bring to you Dangerous Assignment. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to involve my trying to hold an Eastern European country together with my finger ring. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. I do, Steve. Well, where do I go this time? To jail. Let's have that again. You heard me. I'm sending you to jail. Now, look, so maybe I did pad my expense account a little last month, but that isn't enough reason. Seriously, Steve, there's someone in jail I want you to talk to, a woman. Oh, well, you're sounding better by the moment. I'm afraid you don't get the point. Okay, what is the point? The point is on the end of the Krona Cutlass, and it's a sharp one. Look, jail, sword points, I think you better start at the beginning, Commissioner. Take a look at this map, Steve. See this little country in Eastern Europe? What about it? Politically, it's on the fence right now. And as you know, that country has had a history of violence stretching back hundreds of years. Wait a minute. The Kroner Cutlass, isn't that regarded as a sort of symbol of unity in that country? Whoever has had it in his possession has always been able to rally the country behind him, yes. The Kroner Cutlass has been a symbol of unity, or rather was. What do you mean, was? Just before the end of the war, the Kroner Cutlass was given to a U.S. Army lieutenant for safekeeping by one of their national leaders. Shortly after that, the lieutenant was reported missing in action. And neither he nor the sword has ever been located. I still don't see what all of this has to do with my talking to a lady in jail, Commissioner. That lady is the missing Army lieutenant's wife. This morning, the police got an anonymous tip that she had in her possession a jewel from the handle of the Krona Cutlass. What? That's right, Steve. They picked her up and brought her in. The jewel was in her purse. You trying to tell me that the Army lieutenant's really alive and has been sending jewels from the sword... Back home one at a time for his wife to sell? I'm only giving you what facts we have at this time, Steve. But I think there's a lot more to it than appears on the surface. Oh, for instance, maybe this whole thing's a frame, huh? I think it is. But thinking it and proving it are two different things. Naturally, that country is clamoring for the return of that sword. Well, we've got to find it before we can return it. Right. And I think you know there are interests in that country who would prefer that the sword not be returned. Or if it is, that they're the ones who return it. Yeah. That figure's all right. The most important newspaper over there is hooked up with these same interests, Steve. The story of this woman's arrest has already leaked out, and they're making capital of it. That's why we've got to act fast. Now, Steve, get down to the jail. Talk to the lieutenant's wife and get her story. Then go anywhere and do anything you have to to find that sword and deliver it to the proper officials. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Just a simple matter of trying to locate an old beat-up sword, but... The difference is that this particular sword could determine the fate of an entire nation. And I know that somewhere along the line, I'm sure to tangle with an outfit who'll be trying their best to give me that sword. Right in the neck. So, I mosey down to the jail and talk to the Army Lieutenant's wife, Mrs. Rogers. 
I'm glad you came, Mr. Mitchell. Maybe you'll believe me. Nobody else around here seems to. Well, suppose you start from the beginning, Mrs. Rogers. All right. Five years ago, my husband was reported missing in action. I was convinced that he'd been killed. I still am. Go on. In the last letter I received from him, he mentioned something about having a valuable sword in his possession. The, the, the Kroner something or other. Kroner Cutlass. Yes. He said that it had been entrusted to him so that it wouldn't be captured by the enemy. That was the only thing he said about it. And I never heard from my husband again. Then how do you account for having one of the jewels from that sword in your possession? This morning a man came to my door. He handed me a small box and said it was for my husband... Before I could recover from the shock, he'd gone. In that box was a jewel. I see. Well, I didn't know what to do. Finally, I decided to go to the police. But on the way here, I was arrested. I guess they didn't believe I was coming here to give it to them. Later, they told me that that jewel had come from the handle of the sword. Yeah. You believe me, don't you? I'd like to. Look, you say a man came to your door and handed you that jewel this morning. Had you ever seen him before? No, never. Can you describe him? Well, he was short and dark. Well, that's about all I remember. <laughs> that's not much to go on. Can't you remember anything else about him? I'm afraid not. I... Wait. His clothing. What about it? He was wearing a pea coat and dungarees. Hmm. Could have been a sailor. Well, that's still not very much to go on, but I guess I'll have to do with it. Thanks for the information, Mrs. Rogers. I'll see what I can find out. Well, at this point, I don't know whether Mrs. Rogers is telling you the truth or not, but there's only one way to find out, so I start checking. Then, 23 cab drivers later, I find one who remembers picking up a sailor from Mrs. Rogers' address and taking him to the waterfront just in time to catch a freighter that was pulling out the Golden Star. I check further and find that the Golden Star is now en route to Liverpool, England, so I fly to England. And I'm waiting on the dock in Liverpool when the Golden Star pulls in. Pity some people can't learn to stay at home and mind their own business. What? Look, I... Oh, well, my old friend, Inspector Barrett. <laughs> Hello, Mitchell. How's Scotland Yard these days? Still doing business at the same address, thank you. What are you doing here in Liverpool? No, just dropped down to see what you were doing here. Last time you came over, as I remember, you were looking for a microfilm. Yeah, this time it's a sword. My, my. You should have quite a collection of trophies when you finally round out your illustrious career. The... Uh, Anything I can do to give you a hand, old boy? Thanks, but I doubt it. Unless you want to stand here and watch every seaman who comes off that freighter that's just docking. All I know is that the one I'm after is short and dark, which is going to make it pretty tough. Oh, not really tough at all, Mitchell. Here. What's this? Just a photograph of the man you're after, old boy. Huh? Hey, how did you get this? <laughs> Quite simple, really. Your commissioner told us you were coming and why. The Golden Star is a British freighter. So we sent a wireless to the skipper, asking for the name of the seaman who almost missed the ship in the States. He sent us the name, and we nosed around in the hiring hall files and got this picture. A chap named Perkins. Oh, really nothing to it. Oh, well, I got a hunch it wasn't quite as simple as you're making it sound, but thanks anyway. I, hey, look, coming down the gangplank. Right, Joe. Perkins himself. And he looks to be in a bit of a hurry. Want to nab him? No, not yet. I'm more interested in seeing where he goes and whom he reports to. Let's tag along after him and find out. We follow Perkins off the pier. He grabs a cab and starts taking side streets, obviously trying to shake off anyone who might be tailing him, but Barrett and I stick. Finally, Perkins' cab pulls up in front of the railroad depot and he disappears inside. We jump out and follow him, but when we get inside, Perkins is nowhere in sight. Well, quite a disappearing act the lad pulled on us, Mitchell. He's got to be around here somewhere, Barrett. Yes, but where? He may try to get on that train that's pulling in. He'd have to be pretty speedy to do that. That's a through train. doesn't stop here. Oh. Hey, look, that crowd over on the platform. Yes, I've got a glimpse of the glider, too. Come on. Mitchell, he's trying to get through that crowd. Seems to be running from someone. Right into the path of the train. Feller got pushed. One side, please. One side. Let us through, please. One side. One side. Stand back. Hey, not a very pretty sight, is he? No. Looks like we were a bit too late. Well, come along. I say, Mitchell. Hmm? Oh, okay, okay. 
Praying over the blighter is all very well, but... Uh... I wasn't exactly praying, Barrett. Well? Well, I saw your lips moving and quite sure you weren't carrying on a conversation with him. No, I wasn't. But someone from a distance might think I was. I see. The chap who pushed Perkins, for instance. For instance? I say, aren't you sticking out the well-known Nick? If the killer thinks you have any information, he's liable to take a try at you. Well, that might give me a lead, and right now I'm fresh out. <laughs> Strikes me as a rather grim way of getting a lead. Well, where does all of this leave you now, Mitchell? Right in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Looks a little embarrassing for your government at this point, doesn't it? It sure does. A United States Army lieutenant gets a symbolic sword entrusted to him and disappears. Then a jewel from the sword turns up in his wife's possession. Not exactly conducive to good relations between our country and theirs, particularly when the leading newspaper of their country is hooked up with the interests which would like to take over. Yes, I imagine that paper is making quite an issue of the incident. You know, Perkins' murder just now convinces me more than ever that this whole deal is a frame. Perkins was probably hired to deliver that jewel to Mrs. Ford. Mm -hmm. He outlived his usefulness and was killed to shut his mouth. Nice theory, if you can prove it. Oh, incidentally, where is that jewel? In my pocket. What? I'm going to turn it over to the Royal Museum. That's where the sword used to be kept. I guess that's my next stop. When can I catch a plane across the channel? Weather's a bit thick for flying right now, Mitchell. Better take the channel boat. Okay. Well, thanks for everything, Barry. Right, yeah. Oh, it was really... Yeah, I know. It was really nothing. <laughs> well, see you later, I hope. So I board the channel boat. It's dark and foggy, and as usual, the crossing is rough, and I stand out on deck at the rail, and pretty soon a sad-looking little gent is standing beside me. Oh! A little hard on oh. stomach, huh? Oh, 15 times I crossed this channel. 14 times I am seasick. What happened the 15th time? I fly across. Oh, better that way, huh? No, that time I got air sick. He wanders down the deck and disappears into the mist. I stand there a few minutes more. Then suddenly I hear a little noise behind me and I start to turn. Then I hear someone running at me. I drop to one knee. A knife flashes down at me. I grab a wrist and heave. Here he goes flying. Ah! I don't even get a look at the knife artist. My hunch is that it was seasick Sam, but at this point it doesn't matter, except that having missed me once, they'll probably try again. I get to Paris and take a plane east to the country that the sword belongs to, and I head for the Royal Museum in the curator's office. Good morning. What can I do for you? Well, hello. I was expecting to find someone with a long gray beard. This is quite an improvement. <laughs> Thank you, but I am not a curator. Dr. Marzak is. I'm his assistant, Anna. Anna, Steve Mitchell from the United States. Oh, yes, Mr. Mitchell. We have been expecting you. I'm supposed to turn over the jewel from the Kroner Cutlass to the curator. I know. A very unfortunate incident, isn't it? It sure is. Mr. Mitchell, I'm convinced that this is a deliberate plot on the part of those interests which would like to create a rift between our two countries. Well, it's good to hear someone else say that, Anna. Uh, uh, Dr. Marzak is quite anxious to talk to you, but he's busy right now. If you care to wander around the museum and look at the exhibits, I will call you when he is free. So I nose around the museum. It's a typical collection. A few fig leaf characters, a bunch of spears and crossbows on the walls, and a plaster statue of a general on horseback holding a sword in the air. One of our heroes, Mr. Mitchell. Hmm? Oh, I didn't hear you come up. His name is General Krupper. He lived uh, two centuries ago, and he was as devoted to our country as I am. Oh, well, speaking of names, what's yours? I am Gabor, the editor of the newspaper here. Oh, yeah, I've uh, heard of your paper, Gabor. And let me assure you, I have heard of you, Mr. Steve Mitchell from the United States. Hmm, you seem to. So your newspaper is devoted to the welfare of this country, huh? Completely. Sure, sure. And has your interventionist government sent you over here in a feeble attempt to explain away this defamation of our national symbol, the Kroner Cutlass? You know, I'll bet you took those words right out of one of your editorials. The fact remains that your noble army lieutenants feel so little respect for our country that they steal our symbol and sell the jewels from it. Look, Gabor, according to our information, the army lieutenant to whom that sword was entrusted was killed in action several years ago. Obviously, he's alive and in hiding. You could have easily falsified the records. Oh, sure. 
Tell me, is there by any chance an election coming up in this country soon? That has nothing to do with it. Oh, of course not. I was just asking. Do not attempt to cloud the issue. The very fact that you have in your possession a jewel taken from the Colonel Cardinals is proof of our suspicions. Yeah. I must admit it does look sort of bad for us. <laughs> you pretend to be unconcerned, yet I see you wringing your hands with nervousness. But you have indeed a good cause to be nervous. You're so right, Gabor. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, Dr. Marzak will see you now. Thanks, Anna. Well, see you around, Indeed Gabor. you will, Mr. Mitchell. I intend to give your visit here the widest publicity. I'm sure of it. Uh, right in here, Mr. Mitchell. Ah, Mr. Mitchell. Dr. Marzak? I am happy to make your acquaintance. Although I wish these circumstances were more pleasant, uh... Sit down. Thanks. Dr. Marzak agrees with us, Mr. Mitchell, that this could be a plot. That is what I would like to think, Anna. But we cannot close our eyes to facts. I know. And here is fact number one. The jewel from the Krona Cutlass. Oh, oh, wait. What's the matter, huh? Let me see that jewel. Mr. Mitchell, this is the jewel you brought with you from the United States. It sure is. Why? This is just a piece of cheap onyx. What? Oh, no. It's true, Dr. Mazak. See for yourself. This jewel was not taken from the Krona Cutlass. You are listening to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Look, are you sure this stone didn't come from the Kroner Cutlass? Of course I'm sure. Let me see it, Anna. Oh, here you are, Dr. Marzak. <sighs> Why, Anna is right, Mr. Mitchell. Hmm. Well, my theory is that this deal is a frame, but I hardly think the interest behind it would be stupid enough to give us a phony jewel. Wait a minute. Bush, where are you going? I've got a little errand to do, Dr. Marzak. I'll check with you two later. Ah, Mr. Mitchell. Hello, Gabor. Good thing you're still hanging around. What do you mean? Go on into Dr. Marzak's office. I'll bet he's got an interesting story for you. Oh, thank you. I'm certain he has. As a matter of fact, I have that story all set up in print and ready to run. Don't count on it. Gabor disappears into Marzak's office, looking like a cat after a seven-course dinner. I get over behind the statue of the sword-holding general on horseback because if my hunch is right, if Gabor and his outfit are behind this deal, he's going to come out of Marzak's office in a hurry, looking like a sick chicken. And two minutes later, he does. I follow him outside to a phone booth where he puts in a quick call. Then he heads for a little bar. He downs three drinks in a hurry, looking more nervous by the moment. Ten minutes later, a fat gent comes in and waddles over to him. I slip the bartender a buck and learn that the fat guy's name is Kratz, the publisher of the paper that Gabor edits. I stroll over to them. Hello, Gabor. Oh, oh Mitchell. Yeah. So this is Steve Mitchell from the United States. That's right, Mr. Kratz. You know my name. We all have our sources of information. You uh, publish Gabor's newspaper, don't you? Your information is quite accurate. And how is your mission coming, Mitchell? I imagine you're having great difficulty explaining this incident. Oh? You mean Gabor hasn't told you yet? Tell me what? Well, uh, as a matter of fact... <coughs> tell me what? That jewel didn't come from the Kroner Cutlass. A very feeble joke, Mitchell. It's no joke. Ask Dr. Marzak or his assistant. They ought to know. You see, I, I was going to tell you I hadn't the time yet. You perhaps felt it was not important yet. Uh, that, that is, this whole thing is a trick, Mr. Kratz. I, I'm sure of it. You don't sound very sure to me, Gabor. You know, without mentioning any names, it could go together something like this. Someone hires a merchant seaman to deliver a jewel from the Kroner Cutlass to a woman in the States. But the seaman pulls a double cross and switches jewels, keeping the real one. That uh, make any sense to you, Gabor? Uh, of course not. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, there could be some heads rolling for a deal like that. I tell you, this whole thing is a trick, Mr. Kratz. If you'll excuse us, Mr. Mitchell, I believe Gaber and I should have a little talk. But, Mr. Kratz... Sure, sure, go right ahead. See you later, gentlemen. Oh, 
Mr. Mitchell. Hello, Anna. Uh, Dr. Marzak began to think you were not coming back. He left a few minutes ago. I'm uh, sorry. My errand took longer than I thought, but it was worth it. It's nice to have the pressure on somebody else for a change. I'm not sure I understand you. Oh, it doesn't matter. Would you like a ride home? Oh, well, yes, thank you very much. I'll be with you as soon as I finish soaking my hands. Work around these old relics is not conducive to a good manicure. Yeah, I can imagine. Here, your hands are all wet. I'll get the phone. Oh, never mind. No trouble. I... Hello. Hello? Hello? What's the matter? I don't know. Nobody answers. I'll take it. Here you are. Hello? Hello? Oh, it was probably a wrong number. Oh, I wonder. What do you mean? I think I know where that call came from, Anna. I could hear a balalaika playing in the background. It could have been from the bar I just came from. There was a balalaika there, too. But who could be calling me from a bar? That's a good question. Well, come on. Uh, it's very thoughtful of you to take me home, Steve. Here, I'll turn out the lights. Dark out here in the main hall. Yes. Be careful not to bump into General Cooper's horse. <laughs> you think he might kick me? But if he did, it would be quite an event. <laughs> uh, turn to the right here. Okay. I guess you have every square foot of this place memorized, huh? Just about. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, I left my gloves in the office. It, it'll only take me a minute. Wait here. I stand there in the dark, waiting. Several minutes go by, and I'm just about to go back to the office to see what happened to Anna when I hear a faint creaking sound to one side of me. I hit the, I hit the floor. Something plunks into the wall over my head. I get to my knees and start circling in the dark. But the room is empty except for a heavy crossbow lying on the floor. Steve? Steve? Over here, Anna. Oh, wait, I turn on the lights. There. Are you all right? As far as I know. What happened? Somebody took a pot shot at me with a crossbow. What? That surprise you? Oh, yes, of course. What do you mean? You know, it took you a long time to find those gloves, Anna. What are you talking about? Long enough for you to have come back here in the dark and gotten that crossbow down off the wall. Steve, whatever put such a ridiculous idea into your head? Uh, let it go for the time being. Come on, let's go. This is my apartment just ahead, Steve. Okay. Ah, you still suspicious of me, Steve. I guess right now I'm a little suspicious of everything, Anna. Or perhaps if you were to come up and let me mix you a drink, Steve, you might find out that your suspicions were completely unjustified. I might, but that. Okay, I... Oh, what is it? Uh, nothing. Look, I don't think I'll be able to make it, Anna. Oh, but I just Steve. remembered something I have to take care of right away. I'll, I'll be seeing you. What's changed my mind is a glimpse of a figure standing across the street in the shadows. I get in my car and drive around the block and come back. The guy is gone. I look up at Anna's window and the lights are out. Suddenly, it hits me. I pound upstairs and down the hall to her door. There's a faint smell of gas. I start throwing my shoulder against the door. Windows are closed. The gas is on, full tilt, and Anna's lying on the bed. I turn off the gas and open the windows... Anna, here, I'll get you over to the window. Don't try to talk until you get some fresh air in your lungs. There you are. That's better? Oh, yes, yes, much. What happened? Oh, someone knocked on my door. And when I opened it, whoever it was hit me, I, I didn't get a chance to see who. That is all I remember. Hmm. Well, at least this attempt on your life sort of takes you off my suspicious list. But why would anyone want to kill me, Steve? I don't know, unless... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Put it together this way. Only three people outside the enemy's camp know that the jewel is a phony. Huh? You, Dr. Marzak, and myself. Oh, so? So, first an attempt is made on my life, that crossbow gag at the museum. Then an attempt is made on your life oh. just now. Sort of looks like the opposition is trying to keep that jewel switch a secret, doesn't it? Oh, Steve, that means... That means they'll probably try next for the third name on the list, the oh. guy who has that phony jewel right now. Dr. Marzak. Do you know his home phone number? Oh, yes. I I'll call him right away. Hmm. Tell him to lock himself up in a hurry. These babies we're up against believe in moving fast. I know, they... Uh, hello? 
Uh, let me speak to Dr. Marzak, please. What? How long ago? Do you know where he went? Oh, I see. An appointment. Oh, thank you. Where is he? Well, according to the butler, Dr. Marzak had a 10 o'clock appointment at the museum. Who with? Someone who telephoned him earlier in the evening. The butler doesn't know who. Someone who phoned him? Yeah. Could be the same guy who called the museum when I answered the phone. And in my book, that adds up to Gabor. Steve, Gabor will try to kill Dr. Marzak. That looks that way. What time is it? Uh, Ten minutes to ten. That gives us just ten minutes to get there. Come on, let's go. You got a key to the front door of this joint, Anna? Yes, right here. Good. I haven't got any time to waste. I, hey, who's that gent roosting in front of the door? I don't know. I've never seen him before. What do you want? Get out of the way. We want to see Dr. Marzak. The curator does not wish to be disturbed. Oh, who told you that? Dr. Marzak or Gabor? Get away from here before I... Oh. Sorry, Buster. Come on, Anna. Get this door open. Yes. They are probably in Dr. Marzak's office. I hope we're in time to prevent Gabor from killing him. So do I. Where's that turn in the hall? Uh, it's right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, look. There's a crack of light under Marzak's office door. There was a crack of light, you mean? The lights just went off. Oh, shall I turn them on out here? No, I don't want us to be silhouetted when I open that office door. Well, here we are. Now, get down. All right. Here goes. <laughs> well, I my ear, then I hear a back door slam. I open it. There's a flight of stairs. I start up. Then I see a figure coming down at me. I drop to one knee and throw a shoulder into him. He goes flying. <laughs> It's the bottom and lies still. There's enough light to tell me that the stairs I'm on lead to a balcony which overlooks the main hall of the museum. I start up them again. Then a voice from above stops me. Who is it? Steve Mitchell. Where are you, Dr. Marzak? Above you, on the balcony. Are you okay? Yes. I'm quite all right. Thank you. One slug hits me in the shoulder and bounces me back against the wall. Now, at last, I know who the real leader of the opposition is. Dr. Marzak. I flatten myself against the wall and inch up the rest of the stairs. He's shooting blind, and if I've counted correctly, his gun is empty by now. I reach the balcony, then I see a glint of metal. He's coming at me with a battle axe. I duck just in time. Axe cuts the air an inch above my head, and I let him have a left. Brother. Yeah, he just winged me. You can turn the lights on now. All right. Oh, Steve, look. Yeah, that statue of General Krupa. Marzak must have fallen right on top of the sword in the general's hand. Oh. His wake broke the sword off and he fell to the floor. Oh. Not a very pretty sight, is it? Oh, no. Steve, wait. What's the matter? That sword. That is the Kroner Cutlass. What? Yes. There's a coat of plaster over it, but some of it cracked away. It is the Kona Cutlass. Well, how about that? Marzak must have had it hidden right here all the time in the general's hand. Well, I've got to hand it to him. He couldn't have picked a better hiding place. But why, Steve? Oh, it's pretty simple. Marzak and his outfit probably figured that after thoroughly discrediting my country with that stolen jewel gag, they'd produce the sword along about election time and win enough votes with it. But I don't understand why Marzak was stupid enough to use an imitation jewel. He wasn't. What do you mean? Here's the real jewel from the Kroner Cutlass, Anna. Oh. I've had it right here in my pocket all along. But that jewel you showed us. That one I pried out of my fingering. You see, when I was talking to Gabor outside Marzak's office, I realized he was counting pretty heavily on the fact that the jewel I had came from the sword. So I figured it might put the pressure on him a little if I substituted a phony stone. <laughs> it did. Well... I hope Dr. Marzak realized before he fell on the sword that his treacherous plans did not succeed. Oh, I'm sure he did, Anna. Matter of fact, you might say that Dr. Marzak finally got the point. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, was written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and was produced and directed by Bill Karn. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. Dangerous Assignment came to you from Hollywood's Radio City. Enjoy The Man Called X next, and later it's Dennis Day. 
on NBC. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.